time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, uh, good morning Speaker. Uh, it was 18 years ago today that the Greenbelt was established in law. The Greenbelt Act protected 2 million acres of remarkably productive farmland and environmentally sensitive areas, and it was a hard-fought victory, something that all Ontarians are very proud of. But today's anniversary is a solemn one because, as we know now, this Premier is in the process of carving up our Greenbelt. What we don't know is who knew about the plan in advance and how select insiders came to benefit from these land deals. Will the Premier reverse his decision to bulldoze the Greenbelt and release the details of his dealings with the developers involved? And to reply, the Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the, uh, the Premier has, uh, has uh, responded to that, uh, as has the, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. But what we're doing with, uh, uh, with the Greenbelt, in fact, what we're doing across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is ensuring that we have more than enough housing so that people can have uh, their very first home in many instances. Look, Mr. Speaker, there are three 150,000 people. Think of that. 350,000 people who are coming to Ontario each and every year. That's a city the size of Markham. You know why they're coming to Ontario? Because we're bringing back economic prosperity to the province of Ontario. We're creating thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker. And in order to ensure that they also can have the same dream that generations of others who have come and helped build this province, Mr. Speaker, we have to ensure that they have homes, that they have the best schools, that they have good hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We are building a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario, and that includes Bonds? utilizing resources that this province has so that everybody can participate in the dream that is the province of Ontario under this government, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you. And I'm going to go back to the Premier with this question. And uh, I, I want to say, first of all, I think everybody in this room and people across this province know that the Greenbelt and carving up of the Greenbelt has nothing to do with housing or newcomers. <laughs> Speaker, we do know that the Greenbelt matters to everyone, no matter where they live in this province. And I can tell you that because I've been traveling around this province. And let me tell you, it doesn't take long to hear that people are struggling. People are struggling to pay rent, to find a doctor, to get their kids the support they need in school. People are looking for help and a government that's willing to give it. But what they're getting is one that refuses to spend the billions earmarked for health and education. Speaker, how can Ontarians trust this Premier's upcoming budget will deliver for their communities when last year's bu budget hasn't even reached them? And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, happy to uh, address the, the question from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, when I think about uh, why I got into government for 15 years, uh, we saw a, a high a record amount of spending and uh, supported for three years by the NDP, I would uh, submit, from 2011 to 2014. And as I've mentioned many times, uh, in the history of Confederation up to 2003, $130 billion of debt. The next 15 years, almost $200 billion of debt. Now, Mr. Speaker, did those spending dollars go into health care, Mr. Speaker? No. Did they go into building highways so people could move goods and people to market? Did the spending going to go into building more subways to connect the hundreds of thousands of people that move to Ontario every single year? And, Mr. Speaker, where are Response? those people going to live? Where are they going to live? They have to live in housing, and that's what this government is accelerating to make sure we get done. Speaker that, Speaker, that is just typical. That is just typical of this government. When people need help, all they get from this government is rhetoric. Rhetoric. Out there in the real world, out there in the real world, Order. people are tired of it, right? They're tired of it. The fact is, things are far from normal in a lot of places in this province, Speaker. The services and supports that build strong and caring communities have been watered down, whittled away, or just allowed to collapse altogether. And now the finance minister is warning them to prepare for, and I want to quote, more restraint in this budget. I would love to hear from the Premier on this question. I would really like to hear from the Premier on this question. Will the Premier tell Ontarians which services they rely on will bear the brunt of this so-called restraint? And again, Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know it's great being in this house because I'm learning new words, a new definition for the word rhetoric. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, but that being said, Mr. Speaker, let me let me also think about uh, when uh, uh, almost a year ago, when we tabled our budget for the people of Ontario and we took that budget to the people of Ontario. It included gas tax relief because the cost of gas, the cost of everything was going up, Mr. Speaker. It included a doubling of the low income uh, individual and family tax credit so that the lowest uh, income workers in this province got a break, Mr. Speaker. It helped seniors with the seniors' home affordability tax credit, Mr. Speaker. But did we stop there? No. In the fall economic statement, what did we do? We increased uh, ODSP funding by 5 per cent. We indexed it inflation for the first time ever. And we didn't stop there. We increased the earnings exemption. We provided the gains, the doubling of support for seniors and the guaranteed annual income. And also, we continued the gas tax relief for another year. Thank you. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. I don't know what alternate universe this minister is living in, that he thinks that life is more affordable in Ontario today than it was four years ago. Oh, my goodness. Back to the Premier of this province, who I hope will answer our questions. At pre-budget consultations, MPPs heard ideas that would make a real difference in people's lives. So many people in this province don't have a family doctor. MPPs heard from the Ontario College of Family Physicians that Ontario could add the equivalent of 2,000 family doctors to our health care system and serve 2 million, 2 million more patients simply by providing funding for around 19 hours a week of administrative support. Will the government include administrative support for family doctors in the next budget? The member for Eglinton Lawrence and Parliament and the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government is always listening to good ideas from all of our health care stakeholders, and we certainly will look at all of the ideas being brought forward. As I said yesterday, Ontario is actually leading the country in access to uh, family health providers and primary care practitioners, with 90 per cent of people having access, but we know we must do more and we will do more, and that is why we are taking the steps we can, including currently adding 720 positions in 22. 23 uh, for uh, family health organizations, for doctors in those family health organizations, another 480 in 23-24. We're taking the steps necessary to make sure that we have family health, primary care for all Ontarians. And the supplementary question. On what planet? On what planet? There are two million people in this province who don't have access to a family doctor. Uh, speaker, the committee heard a proposal to create a Peterborough Community Health Centre, yeah. very specific proposal, to ensure that people receive the wraparound health care they need to achieve their goals. That means people can keep their jobs, kids can focus on learning in school, families can spend more quality time together. Access to this kind of comprehensive health care is a priority for Ontarians. Is it a priority for this government? Will you be funding the proposed Peterborough Community Health Centre in the upcoming budget? My question is to the Premier. To reply, the Premier. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, when Order. the government came to power, I can tell you there was hallway health care. The health care system was broken. Since 2018, Order. we have 60,000 new nurses, 8,000 new doctors that registered to work here in Ontario. In fact, Mr. Speaker, last year we had over 12,000 new nurses registered, ready to work. And, Mr. Speaker, in the college and universities, there's 30,000 new nurses ready to come on board. We're putting, uh, these are staggering numbers, $50 billion into building new hospitals on 50 sites right across this province, focusing on the infrastructure. And we're going to make sure we have the best health care system anywhere Response. in North America, yeah. Mr. Speaker. And the final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. You know why there's no hallway medicine? Because the hallways are closed. <laughs> 4,000 4, hours of emergency room closures in the last year alone. Speaker, the committee heard from the Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Centre, who told us that they are serving the Owen Sound community, along with two sizable Indigenous communities with only one physician working part-time. They have over 100 people on their wait list which is 12 to 24 months long. They are severely backlogged for cancer screenings, and 
85% of their diabetic clients have not seen a doctor in two years. They are doing the hard work, and all they're asking for is an increase from half a doctor to two. Will you fund Indigenous health services in the upcoming budget, including the proposals from Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Centre to the Premier? Reply, member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Our government is working collaboratively with our Indigenous partners and communities to co-develop programs that will improve access to safe and effective health services. And we acknowledge that programs and services must, uh, services must be designed delivered and evaluated in collaboration with Indigenous partners to effectively meet the needs of Indigenous peoples, families and communities. And that's why we've invested, amongst other things, over $41 million in Indigenous organizations and communities to support culturally safe, mental health and wellness, services for children, youth, families and communities in Ontario. Order. And our government has made clear that we will do everything we can to protect our most vulnerable, which includes our Ontario's Indigenous populations. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. I spent much of this winter travelling across the province listening to Ontarians tell us what should be in the budget to create a stronger and more caring province. Uh, the Canadian Cancer Society told us about the need to expand access to take-home cancer drugs, since that's what over half of the new oncology medications are actually developed for. Currently, OHIP doesn't cover these medications, which are costly and difficult to access without private insurance or employment benefits. Increasing access to take-home cancer drugs frees up valuable hospital resources and makes life a little bit easier for everyone who is battling cancer, no matter their income. Will the government do the right thing in this budget, uh, do the compassionate thing and do the fiscally responsible thing and provide OHIP coverage for these life-saving medications in this year's budget? Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for, for that question. You know, uh, last week I highlighted that the budget date would be March 23rd, so uh, I, I would encourage the uh, member opposite to join us on March 23rd, where she will find out the historic and the unprecedented yeah. investments yeah. that we're making, not only in health care, but in infrastructure, in jobs, in terms of labour, and right across the board. Mr. Speaker, this is a good point in time to highlight a very, very important point. Something that happened last week, on Thursday, and you know what happened last Thursday? Under the Premier's leadership and the Deputy Premier, Ontario was the first government in, Ont in Canada to sign the Canada Health hey. Chancellor Agreement. Hey. The Premier broke the hard jam in this country, and that allowed for us to get it done, to, because people don't want to hear governments just yapping and yapping. They want actual results. They want backlogs and surgeries, they want better health care, they want access, they want where they want. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for London North Centre. Back to the Minister of Finance. I had the opportunity to travel across the province with the Finance Committee, hearing from people about what this government's priorities should be in this budget. Many of the proposals we heard were, from, were small investments that would produce significant long-term savings. The Canadian Celiac Association brought to our attention that celiac testing is not covered by OHIP, which contributes to a high rate of late diagnosis. Better access to this test would increase the quality of life for thousands and save millions on health care dollars by reducing unnecessary x-rays, ultrasounds, iron infusions, and hospitalizations. Will Order. this government do the right thing and the smart thing by covering celiac testing under OHIP? Mr. Finance. Well, uh, thank you again to the member opposite for that question. And I think the members opposite uh, uh, are acknowledging that uh, we crisscrossed the province, not just with the Standing Committee on Economics and Finance, of which they are members. And we went to many communities right across the province, Order. including Kenora, including Sudbury, Sioux St. Marie, Timmins, Kingston, the GTA, Mississauga, Brampton, Durham. London, all over Ontario. And you know what we heard? Order. We heard, we heard that, Mr. Speaker, that our investments, that our plan to build, we heard, keep going. Keep making those critical investments in subways, in highways, in hospitals, 
in long-term care, in human health resources, Mr. Speaker. This government is listening. And that's why most of us are on this side, because we listen to Response. the people of Ontario, yeah, yeah. and we're going to get that job done. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mississauga is home to a large, knowledge-based industries, including a robust life sciences sector that employs thousands of Ontarians. But we know that Mississauga needs to remain competitive if we are going to continue attracting these critical, life-saving investments. Speaker, will the minister please provide an update on what our government is doing to continue creating highly skilled, well-paying jobs and attracting investments in life sciences? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, yesterday Premier Ford welcomed AstraZeneca's latest investment. They were thrilled to announce the establishment of, a, of their Canadian Research and Development Hub. AstraZeneca's investment in Mississauga will create 500 new well-paying jobs here in Ontario. This will enhance Ontario's competitiveness and leadership in our booming life sciences sector. Speaker, Ontario has attracted record investments and in jobs with nearly $3 billion in life sciences alone in just two years. And we now have more than 70,000 life sciences employees working in Ontario. Boss. This is all the result of reducing the cost of doing business by $7 billion annually. And, Speaker, this is what we're doing to attract investment to Mississippi. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. Mississauga's economic prosperity has been made possible by these important investments in life sciences. But beyond that, the prosperity of healthcare innovation and biomanufacturing is a result in the faith that global companies have in Ontario and in my riding of Mississauga Streetsville. Speaker, will the Minister please elaborate on what our government is doing to secure Ontario's standing as a global pinnacle of innovation in the life and health sciences sector? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, it's important to note that years of previous government policies chased companies away. They left us dependent on others for critical goods. They left us unable to innovate in health care, and that's why we released our government's life sciences strategy. This is the first of its kind in over a decade, and it includes $15 million in life sciences innovation fund that will help our new startups, and a commitment to attract five or more investments of over $100 million by, 2020, by 2030. Yesterday's announcement, Speaker, demonstrates that we're well on our way to achieving that goal. Ontario now has everything we need in the global, science, in global life sciences sector to help them innovate Response. and succeed. A thriving research ecosystem, one of the most highly sought-after workforces in the world. Speaker, this is where medical breakthroughs are discovered. Next question, the member for Ottawa, West Nepean. During pre-budget hearings in Ottawa, we heard from the Ottawa Carleton District School Board about the resources they need for a strong education system that meets the needs of Ontario students. In particular, we heard that schools are unlikely to meet the 2025 deadline for full accessibility set out by the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act because funding for building repairs and retrofits has fallen short over the last 25 years. Making sure that every student has equal access to education is a priority for Ontarians. Will this government provide the necessary funding to make schools accessible in this year's budget? Great. By the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. We do believe we need to build new schools and build these schools faster in the province of Ontario. It's why the Premier has allocated $14 billion over the next 10 years to finally build modern schools that are accessible, internet connected, with the highest standards of ventilation in Ontario. This investment has helped us deliver over 100 
capital projects underway today, 200 approved in the pipeline, and there's more to go. The Auditor General recommended to this province and government to allocate 2.5 per cent on renewal to make sure schools remain operationally sound for all children of all abilities, and we have done so, allocating $1.3 billion each and every year in our budget. In addition, the special education budget to help the most vulnerable children in our province is up to the highest levels ever, $3.2 billion, $90 million more today than just last year. We appreciate the needs are rising, and our government and our province will be there for these kids. And the supplementary question? So that was a no to making existing schools accessible then. The Finance Committee also heard about the importance of ensuring children can access mental health programming through their schools. Unfortunately, a new report has shown that less than one in ten schools have access to a regularly scheduled mental health specialist or nurse. Ensuring that children have the support they need to succeed in the classroom and that teachers and education workers have the support they need to do their jobs is a priority for the people of Ontario. Is it a priority for this government? Will they include funding for mental health supports in schools in this budget? The uh, Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. That question. Mr. Speaker, children and youth have the highest mental health care needs of any age demographic. This, inform this informs every investment that we've made as a government and will continue to make. In fact, in 2022, in addition to the investments made in the Ministry of Education, we invested another $31 million in new annual funding to reduce wait lists and support the mental health and well-being of children and youth. These investments are in the community sector. We're, we're innovating on new ways to also treat children and youth and use new means for them to access care. We invested $3.5 million in Step Up, Step Down live-in treatment program helping move kids through levels of intensive in treatment, $2.1 million virtual walk-in counselling connecting youth to a clinician by phone, text or video chat. Dollars were invested, 22 youth wellness hubs in the province of Ontario. Response. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue making investments because this government is more prepared than any other government to ensure that our children and youth get the mental health supports they need where and when they need them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara West. A government that respects their tax dollars and works hard to be good, strong fiscal stewards. And it's essential that our government continues to demonstrate strong leadership by cutting red tape, implementing projects that boost good jobs in our economy, and show overall respect for the taxpayer. Our government must continue to do all that we can to be prudent fiscal managers, especially during this time of global, global economic challenge and rising cost. Speaker, my question to the minister. Could the minister please explain to this House what actions our government is taking to ensure that taxpayer dollars are being spent wisely and appropriately? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, and thank you to the member for the question. The people of Ontario expect us to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. That is why yesterday I have introduced Bill 69, the Reducing Inefficiencies Act 2023, that, if passed, would allow the province to improve the management of real estate, which will reduce red tape, optimize office space, enhance fiscal management, and save taxpayer dollars. Currently, Ontario has one of the largest and most complex real estate portfolios in Canada, and we have been working towards establishing a more holistic approach to managing provincial agency properties. As part of this legislation, a framework would be established to modify the real estate authority of 14 entities under eight ministries to just the Ministry of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we have an obligation to be fiscally prudent when managing government assets. Response. It is my hope that the members opposite will support this legislation. Oh, sure the supplementary question. My thanks to the minister and my thanks for her sharing with the House the important work that is brought forward in this legislation. We saw that until our government came to office, the hardworking tax dollars uh, were not respected, and unfortunately, bureaucracy and red tape grew. We saw that this resulted in barriers, delays, and setbacks to the implementation and management of vital infrastructure projects. But 
as a government, we are making the strategic investments necessary to build community infrastructure and ensure that these crucial projects are completed. We're responsible to ensure that we're delivering effective and resilient infrastructure that serves the needs of our communities, the needs of our constituents, and protects the things that matter most to the people. Speaker, could the minister please elaborate further about how this proposed legislation will ensure that crucial infrastructure projects can move ahead quickly and efficiently? Minister of Infrastructure. Again, thank you for the question. Ontario is developing sensible, practical changes to ensure continued environmental oversight while reducing delay on a project-specific basis. Projects as routine as municipal roads undergo a class environmental assessment with a mandatory 30-day waiting period. The mandatory 30-day waiting period can cause delays in building infrastructure. This is inefficient for the taxpayer and municipalities. Through the Reducing Inefficiencies Act 2023, if passed, it will modernize an almost 50-year-old environmental assessment wow. process that is outdated, slow, and costly. Mr. Speaker, we are living in a world with cost escalations. We need to be nimble, responsible, and we need to do everything we can to continue to build here, up this here. province. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiwetna. Uh, miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, to the Premier. Uh, at the pre-budget consultations, uh, Red Lake uh, came to ask the government once again uh, for funding to build a new multi-purpose uh, recreation and cultural center. Um, this is a request that they have been making for more than 10 years, Speaker. Um, Red Lake uh, generates uh, over $4 million in provincial and federal income tax with the municipal tax base of 5,000 people. This government, I mean, uh, this project is a priority for Red Lake residents, and, but Red Lake needs this government uh, support uh, to start building. Speaker, uh, will there be funding for this multi-purpose center in this budget? Reply, the Minister of Northern Development. And the Digi Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question. The answer is yes. The answer has been yes for some time now. I've spoken to the mayor uh, of Red Lake on a number of occasions, and we stand ready with the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, as we've demonstrated across the province, making investments in recreational infrastructure to improve and ensure the quality of life is there for the families that not just live in those communities, but that it serves, in particular in the instance of Red Lake, a number of Indigenous communities, particularly during the winter, through winter road access, Mr. Speaker. We've made those offers to the Mayor of Red Lake. We stand ready to support his application, Mr. Speaker, as long as it fits within the parameters of a very generous Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, which is responding, Mr. Speaker, to the surge in incredible economic growth Response. in major sectors, including mining, across Northern Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, that yes is actually a no because there's parameters within the funding frame itself. Yeah. Uh, the, this uh, multi-purpose uh, recreation and uh, cultural centre will benefit existing residents, uh, but it will help the community grow. While many people um, come to Red Lake to work in mining, uh, they often take the money they earn back to the south. The area struggles to attract workers who need to support our population, including uh, health care workers. Recreation and cultural center, uh, centers are important to families when they've decided where to live, which makes this center important to the future of Red Lake. Again, I know he, the answer is yes, but the, there is a no in there. Will this government commit to providing funding Question. for this project and this budget? Mr. Northern Development. There's no no and yes, Mr. Speaker. The response to the mayor consistently, persistently, has been that we stand ready to support. One of the nice things about the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is its ability to stack, Mr. Speaker. This is widely known uh, for communities across the, the province, but particularly in Northern Ontario, to leverage local investments, to leverage private sector. Uh, investments from mining operations uh, local uh, there, Mr. Speaker, and as well for the federal government to be involved in that. Many instances we work on larger scale projects with FedNorm, 
a portfolio that I was the minister of uh, in my federal days, Mr. Speaker. It's easily done. The mayor of Red Lake is well aware of that. We stand ready to support him and his community as they set out to build uh, this important piece of recreational infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, there are countless examples across Northern Ontario of where we've had this kind of success. We're going to continue to invest in the quality of life of the communities Response. across Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. First off, I'd like to say it's good to be back. And I did get a chance to see yesterday's question period. So, scandal espionage, accusations of racial bias. I had to check to make sure I wasn't watching CPAC. So we don't need a big show, just a fact, Speaker. In 2018, the Premier was caught on video telling friends he was going to crack open the green belt. And then for the next four years, he swore up and down that he wasn't going to do it. Now he's cracked open the green belt and he's giving it away. To be fair, no, I have to be fair to the Premier. I guess it was hard to decide which promise to keep, the one to his friends or the ones to the people of Ontario. So, Speaker, just why did the Premier break his promise to the people of Ontario? And to reply, the Premier. You know, th first, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for that law ball. It's considering you changed it 17 times. Seven th 17 times. Order. Who were you taking care of 17 times when you changed the green belt? You didn't have a housing crisis. I can tell you what we're doing. We're going to build that 1.5 million homes. There's going to be long-term care. There's going to be hospitals. There's going to be houses for people that can't afford houses. But again, Mr. Speaker, we're doing it to make sure that we build homes for people that can't afford it. We aren't changing it 17 times like the opposition uh, has changed it, endorsed by the NDP throughout the whole process. Yep, they did. And the members can make their comments through the chair. The supplementary question. In case the Premier forgot, I'm the, I'm the minivan guy, okay? So <laughs> the fact is, too many people who benefited from the Premier's decision to crack open the green belt were, by the Premier's own admissions, his close friends. More facts. The Premier hosted a private fundraiser at his home, one that directly benefited a member of his family. Developers, their lobbyists, people doing business with the Ontario government were invited. Invitees, are, invitees were asked to buy tickets Order. and reportedly donated up to $1,000, all to benefit a family member. The Premier has confirmed the tickets were $150. Thank you, Premier. And then when he was asked about who was invited, he said, well, the boys took care of that. Not sure who the boys are. Simple, straightforward fact. Will the Premier admit that this was indeed a conflict and to disclose the list of developers and people doing business with the government who were invited? Thank you, Speaker. Stop the clock for a second. I'm just going to remind the House uh, that it's against the rules of the House to ascribe um, impute motives and to uh, refrain as much as we can from personal attacks. Start the clock. To reply for the government. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ah, the Liberals. <laughs> Th things are so bad for the Liberals that the leader of the Green Party took one look and said, I don't even want to leave. Them. <laughs> this is a party. This is a party who 25% of their caucus wanted to support the Green leader to take over the leadership of the party. Their House leader actually wrote a letter supporting the Green leader to please. Take over for our party, Mr. Speaker. He wants facts. I'll give him facts. Under the Liberals, 300,000 jobs gone. Under the Liberals, manufacturing in this province decimated. Under the Liberals, hydro rates through the roof, Mr. Speaker. Under the Liberals, people had to decide whether they keep their homes or eat, Mr. Speaker. Under the Liberals, long-term care decimated. Under the Liberals, schools closed. Under the Liberals, health care brought to its knees, Mr. Speaker, and under Conservatives, massive investments Fonts. in health care, massive investments in education, transit and transportation back on track, Mr. Speaker. Fonts.
The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, roads, highways, and other critical infrastructure are vital to ensuring our economy remains strong and productive. Unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's transportation networks were neglected, especially in growing regions like my riding of Mississauga Streetsville. Highway 401 is North America's busiest and most congested highway. In fact, approximately 180,000 vehicles use this highway daily just from Mississauga to Milton alone. Our government needs to take action today to make sure highways are less congested and more convenient to keep Ontario moving. And this will ensure that we're helping individuals and families get to where they need to go. Together, let's build the transportation infrastructure needed to keep Ontario strong and prosperous. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please share with our government what we are doing to improve our highway network? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. My in-laws live in that member's riding, and every time I see them, they tell me what a great job she's doing for her constituents. Speaker, I'm glad to inform that member on December 12th, just before the holidays, we announced that our government finished expanding Highway 401 with 18 kilometres of spacious new lanes now open from Credit River in Mississauga to Regional Road 25 in Milton. To break it down, Speaker, our government has taken the previous six lanes along this portion of the 401 and practically doubled it to include 10 to 12 lanes. In fact, Speaker, this includes one new median high occupancy vehicle lane in each direction. A huge game changer for drivers, Speaker, a multi-lane expansion that will help fight gridlock and keep goods and people moving across the GTA. Speaker, widening Highway 401 just goes to show that unlike the NDP and the Liberals, our government Response. is building Ontario and getting it done for drivers. The supplementary question. And thank you to the Associate Minister for the response as part of my daily commute has made a world of difference. Building highways for the people of Mississauga Streetsville and all Ontarians needs to be a priority of our government. Roads, highways and other critical infrastructure help get goods and services to market faster. Clogged roads and gridlock highways impact families and their quality of life by preventing busy moms and dads from getting home to their children on time. Road congestion traps transportation trucks from getting goods to business, costing more than $11 billion annually across Ontario's economy. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation elaborate on how our government will deliver on our promised plan for highway improvements? Thank you. Once again, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. And the member is absolutely right. After 15 years of no action from the NDP and Liberals, Ontario's highway system is simply not where it needs to be. And, and Speaker, from awarding contracts to widen Highway 11 and, and 17 to announcing successful bidders on Highway 3's expansion later this year, and of course, building the Highway 413, our government is getting highways built throughout the entire province. In fact, across the 2022-2023 fiscal year, we have dedicated over two billion dollars to expand and repair highways and bridges across the north and the south of Ontario. What's more, Speaker, this vital infrastructure upgrades will support the creation of 15,700 jobs in northern and southern wow, Ontario geez. combined, while ultimately connecting the province like never before. Speaker, the people of this province elected Spons? our government under the leadership of Premier Ford to get critical infrastructure built and grow Ontario's economy. That's exactly what we're going to do. Well, Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. When pre-budget consultations came to Windsor, we had the opportunity to hear from Hiatus House about the life-saving and life-changing work of shelters for women and children escaping domestic violence. These shelters are grossly, negligently underfunded, and all they're asking for is some stability in their funding and the ability to focus on the work they do for the community instead of needing to fundraise or apply or beg this government for money, apply for grants. Will this government finally break the cycle of violence against women by providing stable, long-term funding to organizations like Hiatus House in this budget? Good. Good. Great. 
The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Sadly, gender-based violence, domestic violence and human trafficking have been more present during and since the pandemic, and it is crucial to ensure that those affected by violence and exploitation <laughs> receive the supports that they need while offenders are held accountable through the justice system. And that's why we're investing in violence prevention and community services that support women and their dependents. And it's why we've launched programs and passed legislation to support our efforts to end violence against women. No woman should be subjected to violence. And our government is working to prevent violence against women and supporting women to escape it and investing in the programs that are necessary to stop gender-based violence. And the supplementary question, the St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. This is to the Premier. Advocates for survivors of intimate partner violence have echoed at this year's pre-budget hearings the same recommendations following the Renfrew County inquest. Ontario needs a plan for housing survivors of intimate partner violence. Shelters are overflowing. Women have to stay in shelters longer and longer because of the challenges in finding their own safe and real affordable housing. And this Conservative government speaker does not have a plan. This is a priority for Ontarians. Is housing survivors of gender-based violence a priority for this government? Will the Conservative government provide adequate, stable, long-term funding for women's shelters, for real affordable housing, for transitional housing in this year's budget. I don't want to hear about five years from now. In this budget. To reply, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, our thoughts go out to the victims of, of, uh, and, and the friends affected by the events in Renfrew. Uh, our government understands the importance of ending gender-based violence, and, and we have programs. We've passed legislation. We're making investments, and this is continuous. This is uh, an ongoing effort. Uh, the pandemic certainly had uh, an effect on Ontario's most vulnerable, and that's why we're working to increase access to safe and affordable housing and providing supports to people who experienced homelessness during COVID-19. We're investing $18.5 million over three years in transitional housing support program to support victims of domestic violence and survivors of human trafficking and, and maintain housing and help transition to independence. It's our government that's investing in helping survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking find and Response. maintain housing and is helping them transition to independence. We are connecting them to socially cultural responsive wraparound services like safety planning, counselling, health and wellness, education, legal and immigration services, financial services. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Of Indigenous Affairs. Today is the 17th anniversary of the land occupation at Douglas Creek Estates in Caledonia. 17 years later, two governments later, and not much has changed other than a second occupied site and no leadership or clarity in terms of how to have productive Indigenous relations on development matters. On February 10th, members of this government were at Six Nations to announce an energy project, a project on lands in Haldeman County. Not one member addressed the mayor who was present that day, nor was any member of Haldeman County invited by this government to attend. Speaker, the minister was part of that entourage, and he was asked by a reporter who the government consulted with on this project. Was it the elected council, the Haudenosaunee Development Institute, or both? The minister didn't answer the question. So, Speaker, through you, I'm asking the minister to answer the question today. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. I also want to thank my colleagues who have been involved in one of the most exciting uh, energy sector projects, I think, that have come along uh, in, a, in a long time, Mr. Speaker, and most notably involve the participation of an Indigenous Communities Economic Development Corporation. We see this, Mr. Speaker, as the future in our energy sector, working with Indigenous communities. And we're going to continue down that path, supporting not just that project, but other opportunities, in, for example, in Northern Ontario, where they have and where they will continue to exist. With respect, Mr. Speaker, to the, to, to the uh, 
the duty to consult with, uh, uh, with the people of uh, Six Nations of the Grand River, Mr. Speaker. We've made tremendous strides in meeting with mayors from the Haldeman Track, Mr. Speaker, including the mayor that you're referencing. We see clarity Response. and certainty as our top priorities moving forward so that any and all projects can be done uh, on a consensus basis, Mr. Speaker, and focus on the priorities of those respective communities. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed because that was not an answer to my question. And as the minister should know, Six Nations Chief Mark Hill has made it very clear he believes his elected government is with whom consultations must occur. Speaker, would-be investors and developers are scared away from Haldeman County because they aren't sure what the rules are. And this minister, as we hear again today, refuses to state clear and consistent policy in terms of who represents Six Nations. Haldeman County asked the minister for clarification at Roma and no answer was given. The Crown has a duty to consult, and the province has handed that duty down to the county in the absence of a framework. Municipalities are told by this province to engage Indigenous communities, but are attempting to meet a non-defined standard. Through you again, Speaker, will the minister please indicate who is to be consulted with at Six Nations? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't accept that characterization at all. In fact, we've been working with the elected leadership of Six Nations on the grants on a plan moving forward, Mr. Speaker, that will bring that kind of clarity and certainty. If this member knew, really understood the dynamics, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the responsibilities of different levels of government, it would be perfectly clear to her that the most important thing that the province can do is work with the elected uh, council of Six Nations of the grant and as the chief has explicitly requested, Mr. Speaker, to have many of these issues, many of these opportunities settled at the community level, Mr. Speaker. To that end, we've made significant progress. We're meeting regularly with the mayors of the Haldeman Tract, including the mayor that you spoke of, other big city mayors, Brantford and Hamilton and such, Mr. Speaker. We're very encouraged that in the not too distant future, a policy position, Mr. Speaker, will respect consensus, Mr. Speaker, cooperation, and a desire to move on the important projects. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay Atticoken. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. The opportunities in Northern Ontario are endless, and we are hearing accounts of Northern Ontario ingenuity daily. Our government recognizes and appreciates and values Northern Ontario. Investments made by our government continue to provide support to improve the quality of life and promote economic development in our communities. But there's more that needs to be done in order to further advance the successes we have achieved. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is increasing economic prosperity for people across Northern Ontario? Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I had mentioned uh, to the member across the way earlier, uh, we're working with our Northern Ontario caucus, uh, and in particular with my friendly neighbour here in Thunder Bay, Atacokan, to ensure that our communities, Mr. Speaker, are able to respond to the incredible opportunities across our vast region. Filming, Mr. Speaker, steel production, steel manufacturing, mining, uh, forestry reinventing itself, Mr. Speaker, all across our uh, region of Northern Ontario, there are many examples of the need to continue to invest in businesses, invest in communities, and invest in Indigenous communities as well through community enhancements, cultural support programs, Mr. Speaker, investing in innovation and research, and investing in businesses, their launches, their growth and expansion, Mr. Speaker, relocation into Northern Ontario as we build out a capacity for supply chains in forestry, mining, and filming, and other examples, Mr. Speaker, we're ready and we're going to continue to respond to the Northern opportunity. In Thank you. Supplementary question. <clears throat> thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is positive and reassuring that our government is committed to supporting the hardworking people in Northern Ontario. Numerous success stories have emerged as a result of the excellent creative and professional work by the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation. Northern communities are unique and not just geographically. These communities have specific needs when it comes to infrastructure, supply chains, and supporting businesses. 
Our government must continue to invest in initiatives that bring practical and resourceful solutions to enhance the lives of individuals, families, and communities in rural and remote areas of our province. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government's investment in the NOHFC is supporting communities across the north? Minister of Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to give a specific example, and it's in Geraldton or Greenstone, as we refer to it now. And this is a particularly important location, Mr. Speaker. It may very well become the new center of gravity for mining in Northern Ontario as we see the incredible opportunities in the Ring of Fire uh, just north of it, the opportunity for, for a corridor that could supply uh, energy, Mr. Speaker, and access for communities leveraging health, economic, and social benefits, and of course for the world-class mining deposits that are located there. Greenstone itself is under tremendous growth with a base metal gold uh, mine, Mr. Speaker, and there's uh, an incredible need there to support uh, economic development in that community. That's why I visited there, spoke with Minister James McPherson, and made announcements in upgrading the wastewater system so that services can be extended for industrial and commercial capacity. Bonds. Supporting the rehabilitation of the local ring at the Long Lac Sportsplex, Mr. Speaker, refurbishing their boat launch and their golf course, including, Mr. Speaker, the clubhouse, which hosts many bi important business events and such. Mr. Speaker, we're responding to the opportunity in North. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Timiskaming, Cochrane. At the uh, pre-budget consultation hearings in Timmins, we heard from the Cochrane Public Library about some of the services they provide for to build a stronger, more caring community. Services like internet access for people who can't afford it or don't have a home to link it to. Do you know in the district of Cochrane, the rate of homelessness per thousand people is higher than anywhere else in the province? Services like printing and faxing documents to help apply for jobs. All services that people need, people from all walks of life. Libraries are often the great social equalizers. They have been through history and they will be in the future. But they're also the first in the chopping block from municipalities who are also having a tough time, a tough time balancing their budgets. But they're incredibly important. Will this government ensure that Ontario's libraries receive the direct, stable funding they need in this budget. Response: The Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member opposite for raising a really important issue in the province of Ontario, one that our government has tackled with a very significant investment of $4 billion. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the member. I think it's absolutely critical in order for every single person in the province of Ontario to be connected to high-speed internet no matter where they live. Mr. Speaker, we have worked with the federal government. We have established a partnership to the tune of $1.3 billion. Mr. Speaker, we are now focusing all of our energies to connect the remaining 40 to 60,000 premises. And Mr. Speaker, we will get it done. Here, here. And the supplementary question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Access to information is essential for the success of Ontario businesses, students and residents, yet there is an incredible inequity in access to information that libraries across the province raised during the pre-budget hearings. Library systems in big cities can afford to buy licenses for online resources, but towns, villages and remote communities cannot afford these licenses. This means that Ontarians and rural communities cannot access up-to-date research, videos and other online resources that are available to residents in bigger cities. In this budget, will your government be investing in the Ontario Digital Library so that Ontarians in every part of the province have equitable access to these licensed online resources? To reply, Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It, I, look, I've, I'm actually quite excited. The NDP want to make investments. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Mr. Speaker. We know that after, they've talked a lot about investments they want to make, right? Now. We know that when we make these investments, historically since 2018, they voted against every single one of those investments, right? When we put more money into the arts and the culture, they have voted against it. When we put $4 billion in the infrastructure, they have voted against it, Mr. Speaker. Now, of course, of course, we need to do more to ensure that all parts of Order. this province are connected, that all parts of this province has ac have access to information so that we can continue to grow the economy. It's not just the hard work of the Minister of, uh, of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, who has seen $18 billion worth of investment 
come back to the province of Ontario. It is why we're making so many investments in small communities across the Response. province so that our small business partners, as he referenced, can ensure that they participate in the amazing growth that we are seeing across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is why thousands of jobs are being created. Welcome to the party. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. As we all know, under the previous Liberal government, access to vital services for driver's licenses, health cards, birth certificates was not provided in an easy and convenient manner. This process made wait lines at Service Ontario access longer and more burdensome. Right. And in my riding, as in many others across this province, it can require many miles of travel to get to Service Ontario. It should have been more efficient and respectful to our fa individuals, families, and our frontline employees. More needs to be done to create a system that better serves and effectively supports individual needs. Accessing government services online is preferred by many and should not be complicated. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to make improvements to Service Ontario? Minister of Business and Consumer Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to thank my colleague from Hastings, Lennox and Eddington for, for the question and all the great work he's doing in, his, uh, in his riding. <laughs> Speaker, uh, first I would like to thank the amazing Service Ontario staff across the province for their hard work, many of whom I've had the privilege to meet in person since taking over this role. Uh, I have seen firsthand the incredible work they are doing across the province, providing services to Ontarians as one of our frontline individuals. So thank you, a big thank you to our, uh, our team members, uh, the Service Ontario staff. Uh, speaker, this government has been able to launch new options and improve our services for all Ontarians, both in Response. person and online. I'm happy to inform uh, the members uh, across uh, in, in, in this House that Ontarians can now use an improved appointment booking system available at many of Service Ontario's busiest locations. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for informing us of the new services. My constituents in Hastings, Lennox and Addington increasingly expect their access to services online from the comfort of their own homes. As I noted, in rural areas, this is vitally important. We must keep pace with technology so that individuals can access information, book appointments at Service Ontario from a digital device of their own choosing. We can't afford to be an offline government in an online world. We've heard the minister say that our government supports modernization and innovation to improve the services that we offer. Speaker, will the minister please elaborate? on how this recent announcement will make life easier for the people of Ontario. For public and business service delivery. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, this government is putting Ontarians first by giving them more choices to access critical government services. We are using data and leveraging new technologies to design programs that work together seamlessly and cut red tape. Furthermore, Speaker, uh, those who wish are now able to identify accessibility needs ahead of their appointments as part of our mandate to ensure that our services are available and accessible to all Ontarians. And we are just getting started, uh, Speaker, with new services being added online regularly, led by our Premier. We are building the service Ontario for tomorrow. As I always say this, Mr. Speaker, Every transaction Box. online is one less person in line. This means that Ontarians can now book multiple services in a single appointment or conveniently book a single appointment. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. During pre-budget consultations, we heard from the Ontario Community Support Association about the difficult decisions this government is forcing them to make. 
They are looking at a 36 per cent reduction in transportation services, which is a reduction of 200,000 rides to medical appointments and other critical services. They are also looking at a 35 per cent reduction on meals of Meals on Wheels, which will result in 640,000 meals not being delivered. These vital services are important to Ontarians, but they don't seem important to this government. Will the government ensure these programs are fully funded in this budget? Thank you, Speaker. We know that the economic effects of the pandemic are still affecting people, and we must get people out of poverty now more than ever. And that's why we have numerous parts, and we're working across ministries, across governments, across layers of governments to make life better for people. Uh, with the impacts of COVID-19 still having an effect, we've, we've launched the micro-credential strategy. We're improving mental health with the roadmap to wellness, the $3.8 billion over 10 years for mental health supports. We're committed $1 billion to build thousands of new childcare spaces. We've uh, launched the $1.2 billion uh, last year for the Ontario Child Benefit. We're investing $90 million to provide dental care to, to low-income seniors. We've got the CARE tax credit, which will provide about 300,000 families with up to 75 percent of their eligible childcare expenses. We've got the low-income individuals and family Response. tax credit, the Ontario Jobs Training tax credit, the Ontario Energy and Property tax credit. We've got the minimum wage increase. We've raised ODSP rates. I could go on. Minister Thank you. And the supplementary question, the member for Ottawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It'd be nice if the Premier answered instead of enrolling in the Minister Protection Program, but I will hold my breath. Okay. I ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Place his question. Did consultations in Ottawa, Speaker. We heard from the Centertown Community Health Centre that they need resources to create a stronger and more caring city. They told us that this government is asking them to do more with less, and what that means is they're going to have to cut one to two staff positions, which will mean 500 to 1,000 patients will no longer be able to access services. Speaker, the Centertown Community Health Centre is integral to a caring and strong community in Ottawa Centre. Will this government ensure that their budget is not cut? Great. Reply. That order. Order. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.